Hi there. Welcome to the From Lab to Launch podcast by Qualio, where we share inspiring stories from the people on the front lines of life sciences. Tune in and leave inspired to bring your life-saving products to the world. Now let's get started with Robert, Qualio founder and CEO, and our show host. Well, I do appreciate you taking some time here to, to chat with uh, us today, Andreas. Um, awesome story. Your company is incredibly impressive. So I'd really love to ask you a few questions to learn a bit about the journey and what's next. And I see where the conversation goes. That works great. And that's the uh, that's a prototype or the real <clears throat> product next to you right there on your right. Yeah, side. yeah. This, this this is one of our development units uh, we're testing right now with people. This was the first one. Uh, this you can see all the wires and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so this was our alpha unit, fully integrated system. We're doing a lot of miniaturization right now. So we're in the process of just getting the it, super lightweight, uh, weight distribution, signal quality, just dealing with a bunch of different head sizes and a lot of that. And just to double check, it, it's uh, pronounced cognition, right? It is. Yeah, that's a funny separate story because the USPTO and the trademark office rejected our application for a trademark uh, on it because it's a normal uh. word even with the X spelling. And so my friend was uh, back in Atlanta. Her name was Sarah Blakely. She started a company called Spanx. I learned from her actually that she used the phonetical use of the X as a K sound. And so we changed our IVR on our corporate phone system to say, welcome to Cognixion. And we, fi- we filed it as a phonetical variant. And so we got it through uh, that way. So so we got our registration <laughs> through, through a loophole of phonetics, but... In truth, we, we call it cognition. It's amazing what you have to do at times, but it's good, good hustle figuring that one out. Maybe just take a, a step back here. What's the story mm-hmm. behind the company? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think the, the origin of where we started, which was really around how do we make, how can we use technology and design technology so it's much more um, humane? You know, that it's not tech, but it's tech that can adapt to the human and feel more natural. And that's kind of our ethos in, in general as product design. But we started out as, you know, a, a way of using technology to augment a person's ability to communicate. So focusing on people that have disabilities, that have trouble verbally communicating or orally communicating, can we allow AI and sensors and, you know, a cool user interface to make it possible for them to do that? you know, and to do it anywhere, whether it's in a hospital or at home or at the, at the coffee shop, you know? Yeah. And I'm curious, is there a story behind that? It feels like it's a, a very particular pain point you folks have gone out to solve. What made you, what made you see that as an, as an opportunity? Yeah, this was, I mean, my background, I've, I've been in product design and development for a very long time. Uh, I started in the 90s. Uh, and so my mm-hmm. first job was at IBM uh, as a designer. So I was helping design some of the first internet and, and interactive experiences using multimedia and stuff. Later in my career, I ended up at Philips Electronics. And so I was working in de- their design group with their consumer electronics, lighting, healthcare, different business units, and helping them figure out what's next in their portfolios. And then when I left Philips, I came to Citrix here in Santa Barbara, California. Mm. Uh, so dealing with cloud computing, software as a service, uh, you know, internet deployed capabilities. So that was kind of my professional background, you know, like using pretty advanced technology, full stack, hardware, software, cloud. But then what happened was just a personal situation. My mom came to visit with us for her 70th birthday here in Santa Barbara. She was from the East Coast. And when she arrived, she wasn't feeling well. And she had to be admitted into the emergency room right away with pneumonia. So the pneumonia was real aggressive. She had to be put into ICU and intubated with a ventilator. She was there and I was sitting by her side trying to communicate with her. I could see the nurses communicating with her. I could see her frustration that she couldn't communicate because she had a tube down her throat. And so at that point, I realized I was like, wow, you know, communication is so vital and every human being, like that's such a core part of the human experience is communication, you know, like expressing yourself and being understood and relating to people. And when that is taken away, it's really catastrophic, you know, for, for the well-being of an individual, plus the mm-hmm. quality of care. Like if you're in a care facility, you need to be understood, 
you know? And so that was really kind of that sort of meteoric moment Mm -hmm. where I was like, wow, this is a big problem. But I thought it was a small problem. I was like, it's a Mm -hmm. big problem for very few people. But as I started doing research on my own time, I started looking at this. I said, holy cow, there's all these communities with individuals with lifelong disabilities or traumatic injuries or progressive disorders that are all affected by communication. And when I added it up, uh, you know, I, I, I was reviewing stuff with the different associations like the ALS Society and Autism Society and Autism Speaks and Cerebral Palsy Alliance and all these different organizations. And they were all doing their own respective research on sizing the market. And then when I added it all up, I said, all you guys are, you have some shared problems that we can solve at a systemic level if Uh we do it right. So you're talking with the market, you found a bunch of people, you found the problems, it was a lot bigger and there's like a shared set of problems. We were, we were literally going association by association, talking to each of them and understanding like, you know, you have the Cerebral Palsy Alliance or you have the Autism Speaks group or you have, you know, the MS Society or, you know, different organizations, Rett Syndrome and so on. And we started to just kind of pull on this thread and say, what's going on here, right? Like what we hear, what we're hearing amongst all these communities is a shared situation, right? Where you have a lot of different sort of disease classes or disorders or disabilities that all sort of present themselves in really unique ways. But what's common is the humanistic desire to be loved, to connect, to be understood. And that usually comes in the form of communication, right? And and what we also learned was Mm -hmm. a lot of, a a huge part of the population. So there's about a half a billion, so 509 million people worldwide that have trouble being understood with communication. And that's related primarily to some form of disease or traumatic brain injury, et cetera. And then when we start to drill down into that and say, well, a large percentage of that isn't cognitive, right? A large percentage of that is purely motor disability. So if you think about your nervous system, you know, you have your central nervous system, essentially what's going on in your brain. Mm -hmm. You have your peripheral nervous system, which is essentially your spinal cord and all your nerves and, and your arms and everything. Typically it's a peripheral nervous system problem, right? There's a lot of breakdowns that happen. And so you have cognitive ability that's locked into a body that doesn't work so well. And oftentimes folks that are in that state, such as Stephen Hawking or other folks could easily be misunderstood, right? Like you would look at somebody like Stephen Hawking, if you didn't know who he was and you'd say, oh, poor guy, right? Like, sorry for you, you know, but realistically, like if you can have technology available, that's affordable, that's useful and you can use it for everyday use. Imagine how many people out there in the world are like Stephen Hawking that are just waiting for an awakening, right? Like we work with a neurologist uh, on our advisory council and he's like, what you're doing is essentially like an awakening. I think there was a movie back in the eighties with Robin Williams, you know, (laughs) and this is the first time I had heard about, like thought about that, right? Like by introducing technology at scale, can we see a massive awakening in society and also in in the community, right? Uh, Because the world could look totally different. If you could imagine a hundred million people, just even a fifth of, of the folks who are affected by communication, 100 million people in the world that could be expressive and understood and doing things and kind of rolling with their life. Like imagine Mm -hmm. what the world looks like, you know, you got a thousand Stephen Hawking's out there. It's insane, really inspirational kind of narrative on on that address. And I mean, Neurotech, did did that exist? Was that like, what was the state of Neurotech when when you folks said this is a problem we're going to solve because I have peripheral understanding of the space, but I haven't seen anything like what you guys are working on. Yeah, neuroscience and neurotechnology has been around for hundreds of years, you know, but it's been, it started out in the you know, 1800s in a super rudimentary way. But some of the underlying science of what we're doing was mm-hmm. actually created in the 1800s, you know, so that's the irony is that most people don't know what neurotechnology is, because most of it's been sort of locked up in labs, you know, mm-hmm. it's mostly been in laboratories or in hospitals or clinics. And most of the neuroscience or neurotechnology has been used in order for PhDs and postdocs to write papers to get published on advancing the state of the art of what we know about the brain, right? And so most brain computer interface technologies have served the sole purpose of understanding the brain better so that drug companies or hospitals or clinics can provide better therapeutics. You know, so it's really an, it's always been an analysis tool, but there's always been the dream and there's been attempts to try and use the brain computer interface technology as a way to interact with the world. Right. So if I can find a way to get a signal out of your noise of your brain and say, okay, there's a control signal here that you can latch onto and use as someone who's using the BCI to do things right, to generate speech or to control things around you. That's what we want. 
right? I think, and everybody kind of wants that, you know, not just if you have a disability, but of course, you know, I yeah. find myself, you know, like when I was I, a kid, I, I used to want to be able to, I, I just wish people would read my mind. You know, some people are like, no, 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 you don't, don't read my <laughs> mind. You don't, you really don't want to know what I'm thinking, you know? So that's kind of a funny. Yeah. Can you install a toggle switch? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Flip, flip up the filter, right? Like, you know, the, yeah, you know, that's my inside voice. So, I mean, you folks were recently recognized, I think as like a top 21 startup to watch in the space. So it sounds like there's more companies trying to do, I think either external, like patient focused, consumer focused products, which is really exciting based on what you just said. I mean, being public facing in particular with a, a medical indication, what was, it, what was it like trying to get a regulatory approval or what kind of challenges did you face with that, if any? Well, we're still facing it. Like we're, that's what we're yeah. looking. That's the, that's the tunnel we're looking to go through right now. Right. So we've, we've yeah. done a lot of the technology development, feasibility, market development, market validation, you know, so at this point we're parallel pathing, like going into production and then doing all of the, you know, collecting the evidence so that we can file our regulatory approvals. Right. So we're going into the FDA with a 510k application will be applying for CMS accreditation so that this can be funded through Medicare and Medicaid mm. uh, and private insurance. So that's what we're looking at right now. So getting through, you know, talk to me in a year and I'll tell yeah. you so, sort of like what that looked like, you know, in the meantime, we're making, we're going to be making this technology available to scientists uh, through universities and clinical labs uh, so that they can get their hands on it earlier. And because they're already working with a lot of the folks that we're addressing in our healthcare population, it's just, it's, it's really symbiotic uh, to allow scientists to have access to the technology first. What do you hope to learn by putting it in front of scientists? Like, I guess, how, what fidelity do you have right now on the technology's function? And, and I'm curious to see how, how that helps. There's a number of organizations uh, around the world that are focused on doing research and analysis, universities mm -hmm. uh, that, are, that are researching what's called assistive uh, technology, right? So uh, working with those folks, a lot of them are also curious about using the BCI as a method for controlling the interface. So that's not a new thing. So we're going to be able to drop this platform into those research labs they can validate how quickly they can get it set up. It's a great alternative. So if you think about doing a, a, a neurology or a neuroscience research project, it's, it's messy, it's complicated. You have to integrate all these things to work together just to even be set up to do your research. And so this is kind of an out of the box, ready to go system, right? Where if you think about, well, you've got an hour with a subject that you're gonna be doing research and acquiring data from, you yeah. know, it might take 30 minutes to do the setup. You know, this is something that yeah. can set up in, in minute, in you know, super fast, right? So you're focusing more on research and data acquisition and and whatever you're trying to do as opposed to the setup process. So, you know, I think that's one is also learning what we can do to help accelerate that setup. Because from a marketing perspective, remember I talked about you know the marketing yeah. work that I was doing before and, and, and Citrix and Philips and and we have this thing called time to value (TTV). Mm -hmm. So time to value is a measure. Uh, it's a psychology measure, but it has a lot to do with application design. So how quickly, if I go from like seeing an ad to downloading an app and installing it on my phone and launching the app and having that first experience where I feel like, oh, wow, aha, I had an epiphany. Like it's what I, it's what I wanted. I did it. Wow. That's really cool. Right. So to have that euphoric moment of truth, there's a certain elapsed time that it takes for someone to have that aha moment that justifies why they bought it, why they downloaded it. So our whole focus is how can we shrink the amount of time, that time to value with regards to a BCI. So for our population, that time to value would be, I said my first words, <laughs> right? <laughs> to go from like unboxing it to putting it on your head to launching the application and orienting yourself within augmented reality and typing out your first word and saying it out loud or sending your first command to Alexa and being able to see the lights go on and off with a brain command. I mean, that's, that's taking impossible things and making it possible. Right. Yeah. That, that's exciting. And clearly there was a personal moment where you saw like it add value to the world use case of what you're doing. Have you consumer plans for this, this as well, or is that still a few evolutions away? It's cause I like to, if I could sit here and write my emails, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it, it's an interesting question. So we consumer has always been on our roadmap, right? But we realize that there's going to probably take a couple of iterations, right, on this to get it to where the form factor and the price and the usefulness oh. and the user experience is appropriate. 
for that. You know, I think in general, consumers have been less, they have been sort of lukewarm to other BCI solutions that have come out. That's why you see a lot of consumer mm -hmm. BCI for meditation and, and quantitative self, you know, because you're dealing with yeah. async, you're dealing with long, slow changes in brain state. And so that lends yeah. itself really nicely for meditation or sleep studies, things like this. When you want to go to like a real-time control interface, you got to do some pretty hardcore engineering, right? Like for real, it's, it's, <laughs> it's hard. Yeah. It's, it's it hard engineering. Sounds like it's the future. Yeah. Which means that this, this isn't cheap to do, right? So we speak to a lot of people and every day I'm fortunate to speak to like entrepreneurs and people in startups who are starting companies in this like in healthcare, right? Sometimes it can be really fast and low cost to get off the ground, but you're doing sounds like hard engineering, which doesn't seem massively accessible just to two people in the garage. So how, how have you kind of like started funding this and scaling this out? Well, we see like long-term, we, we want this kind of technology. So like we've filed a bunch of patents and, and a number of them have been granted so far. And we have a bunch that are pending on this because we, we, we see the future that there's a convergence where, you know, major tech companies have ambitions to bring, you know, really small consumer friendly augmented reality glasses and so on to the market. Mm -hmm. So what we focused on is not trying to invent the, reinvent the wheel for AR, but thinking about how does BCI play well with other sensors and specifically sensors that could be in a, a pair of eyeglasses like what I'm wearing here. And so, you know, what, what we're looking at here with Cognition One is in fact, you know, it's the first platform that gets us there. But those companies that are looking at those multi-billion dollar investments, right, for advancing the state of the art of augmented reality, this is this is the neural interface for that kind of context, right? So when those companies are saying, hey, we need to put biometrics into really small consumer-friendly glasses, we already have the IP and the know-how to do that. For us right now, as we're fundraising and building, you know, moving through building a startup and going through sort of one foot in front of the other, we just kind of looked and said, where's the sustainable market opportunity where the killer mm -hmm. application that the sign, you know, so like looking at all of the, the timing aspect, like where's the timing right? across the business money you know need enabling conditions it's kind of like it's just a perfect storm for us right now for this yeah. healthcare but it does require it's like the perfect storm but you need a boat to go out into that storm right you can't just go out you and do <laughs> absolutely but the good thing is there's a growing number of companies that are part of this i call it like there's this revolution happening right now in healthcare what it means to be a medical device or like a life sciences ecosystem participant is not at all what it would have meant 10 years ago the ai platforms and brain computer interfaces it's i think this is like we're entering a golden age right now where it's this whole new unlocking of applications because lessons learned right like your background you didn't study medicine and work in a hospital for 10 years, you, you were in another field and we're seeing this pollination, I think right now from other industries into healthcare. So I think, I think it's, I think it's really awesome. And I, I applaud, applaud what you do. Any, any lessons learned? So going back to the start of your journey, if you were speaking to your 16 year old self or, or the next people trying to start a company in this space, is there anything in particular that kind of stands out of like, Hey, what's any one piece of advice? Um, yeah, there's a lot of it. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's probably I think, a book worth. Yeah. Well, the funny thing is like on the outside looking in, right. You say we're a BCI mm -hmm. company or a neurotech company, and then the general consumer or the uninitiated might lump everybody together. So I get a lot of questions of like, well, what do you think about Elon Musk and Neuralink? And I'm like, I'm stoked about what he's doing. And it's, you know, it's like, it's fantastic. You know, he's like, you know, what do you think about Synchron or these other, you know, Paradromics or these other folks? And I'm like, I'm excited about what they're doing because if you actually explode the view of the problems they're solving it's as diverse mm -hmm. as the brain itself and you know of the top 10 bci companies of which we're one of them you know we're all kind of complementary in many ways you know we're doing mm -hmm. different things in different ways you know but we're all what we have in common is, is we're all dealing with like neural signals and trying to improve the human condition so what i would tell my 16 year old self, right, is I think we all love the shiny object. We all love the widget. You know, we love to create the technology. I mean, I fall prey to that often is falling in love with the solution. Um, but realistically, I think for an entrepreneur, you really have to fall in love with the problem. You have to really, because you could come at the problem from multiple ways, you know, and so we fell in love with this problem in 2014, you know, and we attempted multiple ways at it. 
And so we ended up with neuroscience as like our third or fourth different way at the problem, you know? So, Mm -hmm. and and it's the one that's the right one, but it took some time to kind of do that. And you can, you can really go astray and burn a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of wasted energy pursuing the wrong solutions, right? If you're focused on just the tech. Yeah. I think that's a really eloquent way to uh, finish our, our chat today. Um, Andres, I think that's one piece of advice that a lot of people need to hear. I see it myself too. I think, yeah, thank you for, for sharing that so eloquently. Um, that's all I have for you today, man. Thank you so much for, for joining and sharing some of your journey. I'm, I'm going to be following what you folks are up to and uh, this brave new world that we're entering into. I think in 10 years time, you will look back and reflect on, on where we are in 2021. It will be a different world. Absolutely, Robert. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of From Lab to Launch, brought to you by Qualio. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and give the show a positive review. It really helps us out. For more information about Qualio, our guest today, or to be a guest on a future episode, please refer to the show notes. Until next time.